Hello and welcome to the third episode of Riverside Tales, a podcast brought to you by the Wildlife Association of South India. WASI, as we are affectionately called, is a not-for-profit society that is engaged in conservation across the mighty Kaveri River Basin. I'm your host Mario Jerome and on this channel, we bring you stories of real experiences from real people about India's fabulous waterways and the rich wildlife they sustain. They say that a single experience can change your life forever. A young boy out fishing with his father one evening was introduced to an iconic fish that did just this. The powerful humpback marsyer. A species found nowhere in the world but in the Kaveri River Basin. This fish is capable of growing to the height and weight of the average human. If history has taught us anything about species extinctions, it is that the larger you are, the more likely you are to perish first. Today, this is the reality faced by the humpback marsyer, the largest fish of its kind. Over the last hundred years, the species has struggled to keep up with our ever-changing landscape. But there is hope. Thanks to teams from the Karnataka Forest and Fisheries Departments, as well as conservationists, we could still reel the species back from the brink of extinction. And one of the key players in this attempt to save the mighty marsyer is none other than today's protagonist. Over a decade after his first glimpse of the fish, he still remains hooked. The Marsyer That Had Me Hooked Written by Naren Srinivasan Here's a story about the Marsyer that had me hooked. I recall this catch from the year 2000. I was fishing with my father on the Kaveri River, in an area that now falls within the boundaries of the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. I must have been around 13 years old at the time. The exact details have faded from my memory now, but I still remember certain events, like they just happened yesterday. Partly because I must have relived this experience multiple times in my head over the last 20 years. It was surprising that I was there, fishing for Marseille. My father was always the one after the trophy fish, spending hours sitting in one place waiting for a take, getting lost in all the sights and sounds of the jungle. I, on the other hand, did not have the patience. I preferred a more mobile style of fishing. I found it more challenging to chase after snakeheads and smaller catfishes. I could get lost in that world for hours together. Even today, it's one of my favorite activities. That day, for some reason, perhaps because it was getting late, things panned out differently. It wasn't quite sunset yet, but it was getting there. My father had given me his spare fishing rod. I don't quite remember the make, the rig or the bait that he was using. But I do remember that the rod was white in color and I remember the orange sky reflecting off it. Nakul Shetty was there too. In fact, his father was a founding member of the Wildlife Association of South India back in 1972. He was camped close by and fishing about a kilometer downriver of us. Renuka, one of the 25 seasoned Kaveri angling guides, was with me. We were perched on a rock in the middle of the Mysuru Madda rapid. My father had the boat a short distance away on a neighbouring rock. Renuka and I had waded across waist-deep water to reach the rock that we were sitting on. I remember the river was loud with thick white water crashing against our rock. It was forceful. I could feel the tiny, almost atomized droplets of water on my feet every time the wind changed. Anybody who has spent hours fishing on the Kaveri would be familiar with how fast temperature drops as soon as the sun begins to disappear behind the hills. The air chills fast, but the sun-baked rocks remain warm for a few hours after. It's a very cozy experience. I always found it therapeutic to run my fingertips through sand or through seeds and millets at the market. And to my right was a little collection of fine sand and dried shells that had settled in a depression. It wouldn't have covered an area larger than a dining plate, but at that moment, it had my undivided attention. I was sitting on my heels, facing downriver. I had the butt end of the rod firmly resting against the rock. There was a constant tension on the rod, with small tugs and tigs that fed back through the line as the bait bounced around in the current. 
Suddenly, there was almost this rude surge of energy through the rod. It's hard to explain what it feels like, but it was powerful and incredibly aggressive. If you have ever been abruptly awoken from a deep sleep, that would come close to what I initially felt. After that, it was confusion and honestly, a degree of worry. It really freaked me out. I felt a huge rush of adrenaline. I almost didn't want it to be true. The strike was just a reflex. And as the hook set, I remember sliding a few feet forward toward the river till I found a good footing. I learnt my lesson right then. Being sure-footed is always step one while fishing for Marcia. And then it began. The line zipped out of the reel and passed. There was a distinct whining of the multiplier reel that my dad heard over the roar of the rapids. He spontaneously yelled for me to stand up and I tried. But it took me forever between trying to maintain the precious foothold and being awkwardly hunched over the rod, gripping it as tight as I could. That could not have been a pretty sight. When I finally managed to stand up straight, I could immediately feel all that tension transfer to my back. And after a few minutes, it became excruciating. There was nowhere to go. We didn't have the boat. I had to reel the fish up to our rock and that meant guiding the fish up through that torrential rapid. It almost seemed impossible. At this point, I couldn't really tell where the fish was. All I could do was lean back against the strain of the rod until I had dragged the fish in a few feet. Then swiftly dropping the tip of the rod into the water and reeling in the slack with lightning speed. I did so several times and all seemed to be going well. I was making progress. I could tell because the line in my reel was now wet. Every time the fish ran, I could see soft mist being expelled from the reel like smoke. At this juncture, the fish was holed up in a calmer recess behind a large rock. That gave me some respite and allowed my attention to shift briefly to the screech of a crested serpent eagle soaring above. Then it happened again. The surface of the water where the fish was resting exploded and the line zipped out of the reel faster this time. The run seemed more vigorous. How was I going to land this fish? It was tiring work. It took me a good 20 minutes to haul the fish past the recess. I've heard stories of fights that ran into two or sometimes three hours. How does this fish have so much energy? And how long did I have to endure this time around? I now had one remaining channel of fast water to guide the fish past. And that was it, provided the line didn't snap on me. The situation was a lot more in my control now, but my back had almost given up. I could feel the muscle burn in my hams and a tight constriction in my lower back. In school, I was proficient at track and field. 100 meters and 200 meter sprints were my forte. I knew muscle fatigue well, but this was unlike anything I had experienced before. In a mix of emotions, half euphoric and half of concern for losing the fish, I asked my dad if he could take over for a bit. He had waded across some time during my state of sensory coma. His reply was simple enough. Sure, I will. But if I touch the rod, then the fish is mine. I can always appreciate humor, but this time my grip on the rod tightened and my attention snapped back to landing this fish. Now the fish was closer. I could tell what I was up against. If ever there was someone who stated that fish aren't smart, they have no idea what they're talking about. Every time I coaxed the fish across the fast-flowing channel, it would go broadside and allow the current to drag its mass downriver. While I was struggling against the rod, the fish wasn't exerting itself at all. If only I could have positioned myself downriver of the fish, my task would have been much easier. I wondered whether we could jump into the coracle and navigate the rapid. Why hadn't my guide thought about that yet? And then, sure as sunrise, in a scene that could have been picked right out of Jurassic Park, a massive dorsal fin cut through the water. It kept rising until I could see the dull copper scales along the back. The fish was huge. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My concerns about fatigue quickly vanished and so did the fish. It drifted out of the fast water channel, but this time towards the nearer bank. The line went slack as if the fish swam towards our rock. Renuka was quick to jump in and cradle the fish in his arms. He quickly used a stringer behind the gill plate to secure the fish before beginning to remove the hook. This was standard practice in those days. 
I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The hook looked like it was barely set, just holding on beside one of the barbels. No matter, the fish was safe. We were safe and it was congratulations all around. We gave the fish a few minutes to rest. Since that day, I've caught countless mass here, be it for recreation or for research. I've always been surprised how calm they are when on a stringer. They never fight against it. Stephen Harper mentions this too in his new book about fishing the Kaveri. In fact, on several occasions, I walked several mass here at a time on stringers up and down sections of the river. The game is similar to walking multiple dogs on leash, watching out for twisting lines and pre-plan your route. By now, the boat had zipped down river to share the news. Nakul and his party were up towards us just after sunset. We then began to weigh the fish. But as usual, we had forgotten the weigh sling. I took my t-shirt off and pierced a hole through the front as a makeshift sling. We slid the fish in and weighed it. It topped off at 35 kilograms. That's respectable, I thought to myself. Unknown to me at the time, that would be the largest mass air I ever landed. And given the current endangered status of the humpback mass air, I'd be lucky if I were able to see such a specimen again. We took a wonderful picture in the low light. Smiles all around. And then it was done. The fish glided away into the night. And suddenly time seemed to stand still. The fierce gushing rapids now seemed calm and soothing. And the Kaveri continued, as always, to roll through the valley of the humpback Marseille. We hope you enjoyed that story. Thank you for listening in to the third episode of Riverside Tales. Don't forget to tune in every first Saturday of the month for our next installment. This series is brought to you by Wasi as part of their Golden Jubilee celebrations. To learn more about Wasi's conservation work in the Kaveri Basin, do visit and subscribe to Wasi's website, Instagram and Facebook pages. If you liked what you heard today, please do follow the podcast, give us a like or a quick review and do share the podcast with your friends. From me, Mario and our producer Arvind Raj, a very goodbye until the next episode.